Hello, and welcome to the Urban Classroom. Hi, I'm Mr. Brooks, and thank you for joining me today in the Urban Classroom. We are now on Unit 7, Part 3. This is the third and final lesson from Unit 7, and then we're going to move on to Unit 8, which is the Road to Civil War. So with Unit 7, this last lesson, it is about free enterprise and the Industrial Revolution. So we're going to learn about how the United States was able to build its economy primarily through free enterprise and the Industrial Revolution. Now, if you want to make money in this country, you need to know about products and services. These are two different ways that people make their money in our country, in any country, all around the world. Either a product is made, and when I say a product, I'm talking about an item that can be uh, made and then is sold to earn money. Could be a hat, a cap, could be shoes, uh, watches, cell phone. It could be anything that is made and then it's sold and that's how a business or a company makes money. Also, people make money through services. Now, services are activities that are performed to earn money. So if you think about a painter, a painter is not selling an item. There's no product. The painter is selling a service. So if a painter comes to your house and paint the house, you gotta pay, that's the service. It's just like the, the same for the doctors, for the teachers and the barbers, they are performing a service and then the customer pays the money for the service, okay? So two ways that people can make money in this country, through products and services. Now there's other ways that people make money, but these are the two that I'm gonna focus on today. Now, as we talk about money, we have to understand producers and consumers. When I say producers, I'm talking about businesses, I'm talking about companies. And what they do is they, they make an, an item and it is sold. So we have goods, you have services. These are provided by the producers. Now the producers, they often make the same type of goods. When I say goods, I'm not talking about like happy or good or that was nice. No. When I say goods, I'm talking about an item, a product, something that was made. So they are often the same type of goods or they may offer the same type of service, but they're at different prices. For example, you can go get your um, nails done at once one beauty shop and it might cost $25. But then if you go to another beauty shop or nail salon, it might cost you $55. You're still getting your nails done, but the prices could be different because of the quality. So producers, they offer different prices and different types of quality. Think of it as going to get a burger. You can get a burger at one restaurant and the burger is, it's okay, maybe it costs a $1.99. But then you can go to a different location at a different restaurant, you still buying a burger, but that burger could cost you $12.50 because the quality is probably a lot better. So businesses are competing with each other. They're trying to make sure that they make money because if they don't make money, then they're gonna go out of business, okay? So those are the producers, the companies that are making and selling the product or providing a service. Now, when people spend money to buy or use something like a goods or a service, then we are called the consumers. We spend our money, we're consumers. We, we, we buy things, we use things. We go to stores and we spend our money. Now, as consumers, we have choices. We get to decide what we want to buy. And usually consumers, they want a very high quality item, but we want low prices, okay? We want something that's good, something that's valuable, 
something that is well made but we don't want to pay too much for it really okay now so those are the producers and the consumers we're trying to learn a few vocabulary words because we have to understand this thing called free enterprise okay so when i say free enterprise i'm also talking about a free market system when i say market i'm not talking about no supermarket no not where the food is at it's a different kind of market when i say free market i'm talking about money making money financial systems fine so in the united states people have the freedom to produce and they sell whatever they want to that's what a company can do a business can do that they can buy and sell they can uh, produce and sell whatever they want to and then the customers we have freedom to buy and use whatever we can pay for now if you're trying to make money in this country you got to understand this free enterprise system businesses that are making multi-million dollars each year they're asking themselves four questions the four questions are first of all what should be produced what should i make maybe it's an app maybe it's shoes maybe it's um a hairspray maybe it's a kind of gel for my hair maybe it's clothes a t-shirt it's something you got to ask yourself though what should be produced now once you decide on what you're going to produce you got to think about how should it be produced what kind of materials do i need what kind of resources do i need to have this item made how should it be produced that's the second question now the third question is who do we make the product for if i'm designing these new shoes and they got like four inch heels am i making it for a person who is a young adult am i making it for older women am i making it for tweens who am i making this product for then you got to ask yourself how much should the price be how much do i need to charge people for my product so you're not too young to start thinking about this some of you might have an idea already that you can market by making this item or getting it produced and selling it some of you have already thought about this being your having your own business having your own company well if you ever thought about having your own business or having your own company then you were thinking about the free enterprise system now have you ever seen these types of warnings before you ever seen a commercial where they say take this medication and, and maybe it'll help you with your heart or it'll help you with your blood pressure but then you find out it causes all kind of sides effect they're talking about vomiting and diarrhea and you might lose your hearing and you can even die from it yeah you've probably seen these kind of warnings before well there's a reason why those warnings are on products and they are uh, maybe like at the bottom of the screen if you ever saw on tv but the person reads really fast and you can't really understand what you're saying but it's some kind of warning about the service that is being provided well this is all a part of the free enterprise system see the federal government makes sure that businesses post different types of warnings on their products and their services because the government has a responsibility to protect the consumers now remember that word consumers those are the people who are buying or using something when the government is making sure that businesses tell us information to keep us safe then this is part of what is called limited government involvement okay so let me explain that a little bit more in depth with limited government involvement the government makes sure that people receive warnings about products and services so that we can stay safe because the government really does want these companies to do well and the company can do well if the people are safe and are comfortable 
with buying the product. Limited government does not let the government just get in there and tell the business what they can do and what they can't do and uh, tell them how to run their business. No, there's some limit. But the government can set some rules. Limited government involvement is about the government setting some rules to keep people safe. Now, businesses that are successful, they're making money, that benefits everybody because those companies and those businesses, they will pay taxes. So if you own a business, if you own a company, you're going to have to pay taxes for the most part. Some people do know how to get around that. But for the most part, you're going to have to pay taxes. And with this free enterprise system, that tax money is used to support public services and de the defense of the United States. For example, you have people in the military, the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Coast Guards. Well, they're not working for free. They got to get paid. Tax money, money from businesses, from companies, when they pay that to the government, that goes into, just think of it as the United States checkbook, the United States uh, bank account. And that money, that tax money is used to help pay for our military services. But that money is also used for public services, like the park that's down the street from where you live at, or the, the roads that are being rebuilt. The government helps pay for that through tax money. So the government wants you to have a business. It's good to have a business because once you got that business, you're going to be paying some taxes. And that tax money is going to help society. So that's why the government just want people to be safe. They have limited involvement. They make sure that we are safe, but they also allow these businesses and their companies to make whatever they would like, charge as much as they would like, and just make sure a few rules are in place. This is limited government involvement. Here's another vocabulary word you'll need to know about, industry. When I say industry, there's two words that it's got to come to your mind like automatically. When you hear the word industry, think of factories and machines. Again, when you hear that word industry, think of factories and machines. Because industry is about earning money by using these factories and machines to make products and finish goods. Uh, the items that could be made could be um, a car, it could be computers, seats, um, chairs, it could be containers, it could be anything, but they're made in a factory, and this is a part of industry. So that takes us to the Industrial Revolution. The, re the Industrial Revolution is a, a period in time. It is when factories and machines did most of the work. It is when iron production began. It is when the factories used steam power and water power. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the Industrial Revolution. But remember, this is about a period of time when we're using more factories and we're using more machines to make things that will be sold. To understand the Industrial Revolution, we have to talk about mass production. Mass production. So mass production is about producing or making an item cheaper, faster, and easier. When you think of mass production, let those three words come into your head. Cheaper, faster, and easier. So this is what the machine is going to allow the workers to do to build a product or produce a product cheaper, faster, and easier. The items are manufactured in large quantities. That means in a large amount, you're making the same item over and over and over, and it's on some type of uh, maybe an assembly line so that the labor, the work is divided. So everybody has a certain part that they have to 
uh, do to complete and make a, a product. For example, if we were um, making, let's say, on the sandwich, if you look at the, the little cartoon that's playing, the sandwich is being made. Okay, so one person just puts the cheese on. Another person just put the meat on. One person just put the sauce on. Everybody has their own part to do. But when you're finished, you have a complete sandwich. You could think of an assembly line in that way. Now, all the items I said are standardized. They're the same design. Think about candy. If you open up a, a bag of candy, it's going to be the same. If it's chocolate, it has chocolate. They all had about the same size, the same color, the same shape. Um, the items are identical to each other. Now, maybe the color, you know, the color change because they're made separately. But then when you put them together, you have a lot of different colors, it's like the M&Ms, for example. Well, there will be a section where all the red ones are in one location and all the blue ones in a different location all the green ones in a different location all the then you finally bring those together and they're placed in a bag and that's how you have an assorted assorted colors okay so think of mass production as the same item being made over and 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 over again but in very large quantities, thousands, thousands and thousands of the same thing being produced. That's mass production. Now mass production was possible because of interchangeable parts. If you look at that title, interchangeable parts, it looks like a long word, but it, it really isn't. It tells you exactly what it's about. Interchangeable part. So there's a man, his name is Eli Whitney. He invented this idea, this concept about interchangeable parts. When a machine broke, you would be able to replace the part that is broken with a new part instead of having to throw the entire machine away. So this was a way that business was able to save money because it's cheaper to replace a part instead of buying a new machine. Now, Eli Whitney, he was able to um, put this concept into action when he had a contract with the military. The military wanted him to make weapons and he came up with this idea of the interchangeable part because if one part of the weapon broke then what what are you going to do you'll you have to throw away the whole thing try to fix it well think about if each part of the weapon had a number an identification if one part broke all you got to do is just remove that part and replace it with the new part. Because remember, mass production is producing the same item over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. So there is a spare part that you can take and replace it with the broken part. So you're gonna have large quantities of goods that are going to be produced, mass produced, and the cost of that part will go down, it'll be lower. So interchangeable part. Another way to think about interchangeable part, think about um, a door that you had made, custom made door, your front door, but there was only one key. So the person who built that front door only has one key to the door. Well, what happened if you break that key or you lost that key? Well, they'd have to, before interchangeable parts, they would have to take the whole door down and you'd have to buy a new door. Well, that's a lot of money. But think about interchangeable parts. If more than one key was made and the keys are identical, well, if you lost your key or your key broke, then you can just go get the new key 
buy the new key and unlock the door and continue to use it. Okay, so that should help you understand a little bit better about interchangeable part. Eli Whitney, he, he's also famous for inventing a machine called the cotton gin. Now the cotton gin is a machine that was used to clean the cotton that enslaved laborers were forced to pick. Before the cotton gin, enslaved people had to pick the cotton and then take out the seeds by hand. Now think of it, if you're trying to fill um, the size of a trash can up with cotton, like the cotton balls that you, you buy, you, if there's seeds and dirt and thorns inside the cotton, you, you got to get it out. Do you know how long that's going to take you to get the thorns and the seeds out of that cotton? You're going to be there all day trying to clean that cotton. But this man named Eli Whitney, he invented this machine where you put the cotton in the top of the machine. If you look at the picture that's inside the blue circle, the cotton goes in the top and then the worker had to just turn the machine by hand and then the clean cotton would come out. It'd be at the bottom. So this is a way that Eli Whitney was able to help uh, people mo mostly in the South that were producing cotton uh, help them clean that cotton faster. Now, unfortunately, it didn't really help black people who were slaves because slavery was actually going down in the South before the cotton gin. But once the cotton gin was invented, that means you can clean the cotton faster. That means you can make more money. And that's why a lot of owners in the South wanted more slaves. So then that forced slavery to go back up where people start buying more and more slaves because the cotton could be cleaned very easily and then sold. So it was an invention. It helped, but it hurt a lot of people. It helped, but it hurt. All right, so that's Eli Whitney, and he had the idea about the interchangeable parts, and he also invented that machine called the cotton gin. Here are two more vocabulary words that we need to know about. Urban and rural. Urban, think of like a city area, big city area where lots of people, a lot of factories, a lot of transportation systems. And then think about rural. Rural is like farm area. Think of the countryside where you see cows and you see horses and you see farms. Okay, so those are two vocabulary words that we need to know as we continue. Many people are going to start leaving the rural farm areas and they're going to be going to the big urban city areas because of more jobs in those factories. If you have more jobs, then more people could get paid. Now think about it. If you had a job on a farm, how many people could work on a farm? What, about 10 people maybe could get a job at a farm? But think about an urban area in a big city area. How many people could get a job in that factory? Look at the size of that factory. They could probably hire, what, 100 people, 300 people, 500 people? Well, there's more jobs in the urban area, so people are going to leave the farm area, the rural area, and they'll be going to the urban area, which is the city area. Another vocabulary word that we need to know is textile. Um, textile, think of cloth, think of fabric. Okay, so textile is this industry of textile industry is going to open up a lot of opportunities for people to get jobs. Let's see how. See, in the rural area, this is before the Industrial Revolution, you would have people who worked at home. 
They worked at home and they would spin wool or cotton by hand using a machine called a spinning jenny. Now, this machine worked by the lady just like tapping her foot. She'd like push down this pedal and it will help spin the, um, the wool or the cotton. Now, that system is called the domestic system. Okay, so you're spinning wool, and wool comes from a sheep through shearing. If you take a look at the top picture on the right, you'll see it's like the wool. The wool is like a sheep getting a haircut. Okay, so you take the wool, and that could be um, used to make thread. And this machine called a loom. Now, when I say a machine, I don't want you to think like I'm talking about something you plug into the wall. That's not what I'm talking about. They didn't have that back then. They didn't have electricity like that. It was used by hand. The loom worked by moving um, different parts of the machine to, to weave the thread. Think of like braiding, like, like braiding hair. It's, it's weaving. So you have people using the system at home called the domestic system where they're making things by hand. But a lot of these people are about to lose their job. They're about to lose their job because the factories are opening up in the urban areas and they offer more opportunities. Okay, so the domestic system, making stuff by your hand, that's how it was at first. But now people are getting ready to leave the rural areas, and they're going to the city. Now, textile jobs are going to be offered. There's a man, his name is Samuel Slater. He started this, uh, like a thread making company, a, a business. The cotton is turned into threads, and then the threads can be woven to make cloth. Now, Samuel Slater and a man named Francis Cabot Lowell, they are helping produce a lot of jobs for people. And a lot of women and young girls are going to be able to get jobs in those factories um, working in the textile industry. So producers are able to make a lot of textile products. Remember when I say textile, just think of cloth fabric or material. They're able to make a lot of textile products on a global scale. So they're not just making it for their neighborhood or for their city. It's enough textile products that could be made for like all the people around America. And this opening of so many job opportunity is going to cause even more and more people to come into the urban areas okay so the domestic system is kind of fading away people are not at home trying to sew a dress by hand because you're trying to make a dress just by sewing it with needle and thread that probably take you about four months to do that but with these machines a person could just go into the store and buy a dress that was made by the machine already okay so textile jobs are opening up in the big urban areas companies are making money but unfortunately it's like it's always something good but then it's something bad too the people are getting paid they're making money they, they're working in the factories the businesses are doing well, but the factories, they get their water from the nearby rivers. The water is needed because it's the water makes the steam. And, and then these machines that are inside the factories, they run by steam power. If you ever saw the Polar Express, um, that's relating to steam power as well. And they use coal too. Okay, so these factories, once they use that water, that water is polluted because it ran through the machines. So it has maybe like oil, it has uh, dirt, it has 
grime, you know, from the machines. And then that water is, is it like a pipe? Uh, the water goes through the pipe and goes um, to where the river is at. And then all that waste water is dumped right back into the river. Well, there are life forms, wildlife that depend on that water. So the deer goes out and drink the water. You got fish in the water and that water is now polluted, contaminated. And so the, the wildlife dies. The fish die, the deer die, and just imagine what's happening to people's body when they eat that fish and they don't know that the, it was contaminated. Well, this is a problem because it's a problem for the environment. The factories, they just, they didn't have like the rules and the laws today that help protect our environment. Companies just dump that pollution right there in the middle of the water, just dumping it back in the river. And so this was really hurting our environment. It's a cause and effect relationship, you know, because the, fa the factory was using these machines and using steam power. Well, the effect is that our environment was polluted and a lot of wildlife will be destroyed. During this time, we have a lot of changes in transportation systems. Uh, America will start developing roads and turnpikes. We'll start getting uh, water canals, using more of the railroads, and also um, steamboats. These are different changes in transportation. Okay, and I'm going to talk about a few of those. There are two people that I want to talk about uh, now, Robert Fulton and Samuel Morse. Um, Robert Fulton is the one who invented the steamboat. Now, the steamboat was a form of transportation. It is a way to transport and trade goods up and down the Mississippi River. And you also can transport people that were trying to get from one state to another state. So because of... Robert Fulton inventing the, the steamboat, um, America's economy is going to increase. Remember, rivers are good for two things. When you think of rivers, think of transportation and trade. And that was made possible uh, or increased transportation and trade by the steamboat. Samuel Morse he was an inventor. He made this machine called a telegraph. Um, the telegraph is a communication device. It is technology. Now, it's not technology like something that you plug into the wall. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not ran by electricity. Um, the telegraph was a machine that could send a message from one person in a location to a, another person in a different location. Think of it like texting a friend how you can type in the letters and then uh, press a button and then it sends a message to your friend who could be in another city. Well, the telegraph is like the early version of texting. Morse, he used a code. He named it after himself. It's called Morse code. And it included dots and dashes, dots and dashes to represent certain letters. And so those combinations of dots and dashes could spell out words. And um, the person on one end, maybe like at a post office, would see the information coming in, the dots and the dashes, and would be able to write out the letters that were represented. And so you could go into the post office, say you wanna send a, a letter to a family member, tell them what it needs to say, and then the operator there will use the machine to input the dots and the dashes. And then in a different location, you have an output where the dots and the dashes will show up, and then a person would just write out what the message was so that the receiver can actually get the message. So through the telegraph, people are able to send out and receive a lot of more information now and very 
easily because of the Morse codes. So two very important people, Robert Fulton and Samuel Morse. Robert Fulton is a steamboat, Samuel Morse, the Morse code with the telegraph. Earlier, I mentioned that the Irish immigrants were the ones who helped build the Erie Canal. They also was the one who helped build the Transcontinental Railroad. Well, the reason why thousands and thousands of Irish immigrants, actually up into the millions, came into the United States because of what was called the potato famine. The potato, you know, the papas, what you, you eat, the french fries. The potatoes was the main staple of Irish people back in Ireland. And something happened like to the ground. The potatoes, they rotted. And when they rotted, you, you, you couldn't eat them. They were rotten. So a lot of people decided that they would leave and they were going to come to America. They're trying to live the American dream where they can have a better life for themselves and for their children, just like immigrants of today come to the United States for better opportunities. Well, unfortunately, the Irish immigrants are going to experience a lot of prejudice. They're going to experience a lot of discrimination because they were Catholic. And most uh, of the people in America during this time were not Catholic. A lot of people were Protestant. So the Irish immigrants, they weren't treated like fairly or equally to um, 
the white people that were already in America or like the ones that came from England, they, the Irish people had a hard time because of their religion and they were looked down upon, even though uh, Irish immigrants made great contributions to America's society and as well as being workers and help building America's infrastructure, help building uh, America's transportation system. So um, it's unfortunately that a lot of, of people who were immigrants when they come to the United States are not treated fairly, but um, that can change. And your generation can be the generation that helped change the way that we treat immigrants in our country. So today we learned about how the United States was able to build its economy by using the free enterprise system as well as the Industrial Revolution. I'd like to thank you for joining me today in the Urban Classroom. This is where we are learning about U.S. history from the 13 original English colonies to settling the Western frontier after the Civil War and Reconstruction. Be sure to watch the next video lesson because we're moving on to Unit 8, which is the road to Civil War. Why don't you have a great day and just make it a great day. Bye!